There's a romanticism about the thought of being able to take renewable energy, convert that renewable energy into hydrogen. Tomorrow's vehicles could be driving totally zero emission free. That's a major step forward. Hydrogenx is a uh, hydrogen technology company. We have two uh, core business units. The first business unit focuses on electrolysis. We use electricity and we separate water into its two basic uh, components, hydrogen and oxygen. The other business unit that Hydrogenx has is the fuel cell business unit. That business unit manufactures hydrogen fuel cells for a variety of markets. Fuel cells take hydrogen as a fuel and produce electricity. For me, it's a bit of a passion. I love what I'm doing. I, I can see the benefit and I can see where it's going. Well, I think it started sort of way back. Uh, and this is going back to grade six where I uh, did a science fair project on electrolysis. The company was started in 1995. At uh, that time, we had a vision that we wanted to get into hydrogen and fuel cells and develop products. One of the first products though that we focused on back then uh, was test equipment for the up and coming fuel cell industries. A fuel cell is very similar to a battery. It is an electrochemical device, um, but it shares similarities to the internal combustion engine in that you have a fuel tank. Uh, so hydrogen is in a tank, it's the fuel, and it gets delivered to the fuel cell, which is like a battery. At that point, the hydrogen and the oxygen in the air are able to react and uh, produce electricity. And the byproduct of this reaction is water and heat. So typical hydrogen fuel cell vehicles today get ranges in excess of 400 kilometers on a full tank of hydrogen. The other key advantage of a fuel cell vehicle is that you can refill that tank within minutes. Hydrogen costs about $8 per kilogram. So when you look at filling a fuel cell vehicle, 5 kilograms times 8 is $40 to fill up your fuel cell vehicle. It's always been a sort of chicken and egg, the infrastructure company saying, we'll put the infrastructure when the vehicles come, the vehicle manufacturers saying, we can't place the vehicles until the infrastructure comes. Germany has stepped up, and in September of 2009, both the infrastructure companies and the automobile manufacturers came together, signed a memorandum of understanding saying that the automobile manufacturers uh, are committing to release hundreds of thousands of vehicles in Germany, fuel cell vehicles, and the infrastructure companies are saying we're committing to install the infrastructure that will be required for 2015 for the release of the vehicles. Hydrogenics has also developed a fuel cell battery hybrid midibus as part of a program sponsored by the European community and the German state of North Rhine-Westphalia. The buses have been running with early technology and it's been performing uh, beyond expectation. In terms of infrastructure, you install one fueling station in the city and all the buses go back to that fueling station to refill. So zero emissions. The uh, autonomy of the bus ranges from 250 kilometers to 400 kilometers for the bus, which is more than enough for an urban transit cycle. And again, we're continuing to see more and more interest as transit authorities sort of explore next steps in the greening of their fleet. We're supplying fuel cells uh, for backup power. In backup power, typically you're backing up using lead acid batteries and, and a diesel genset. And the fuel cell has the ability to replace both the lead acid batteries and the diesel genset. Advantages over batteries, uh, batteries need to be trickle charged, uh, they need to be conditioned every so often. The advantage of the fuel cell and hydrogen is when the fuel cell is off, it's off. We're working with uh, Germany's DLR. Uh, DLR is uh, the equivalent of Germany's NASA and we've uh, landed a contract to deliver fuel cells that will be used in powering uh, a sailplane that will cross the Atlantic uh, sometime in 2012. In light mobility, we're working with forklift OEMs, again, bringing the fuel cell technology. We're not a forklift manufacturer. We will target and work with an OEM to introduce the technology and move from prototype to first deployment to first fleet deployment. That's been our approach uh, in the bus market, in the forklift market, in the backup power market. One of the biggest challenges is making sure, you know, both government and public understand the value of this technology, certainly in North America. Uh, so that the support and planning for the technology continues. It's very important that this technology, certainly in the next couple of years, uh, gets adopted in, in a large way. We need to move from 
from lab to early manufacturing into some fairly large-scale manufacturing. And so it's important that some of these uh, markets begin to open up and that fuel cells become competitive with incumbent technologies. I think we're there, but it's always a question of timing. One year more, one year less can be very important in an early-stage technology company. The U.S. has some pretty uh, attractive uh, tax credits for companies that deploy fuel cell technology in backup. Uh, and that will be a fairly large driver for volume in 2011 in North America. We have a technology roadmap that uh, we can absolutely see clearly where we need to be and what we need to do to get there. And that's what we're working on every day. Today, because we have both uh, performance, durability and cost, we're beginning to open up and enter, enter markets. It's taken that long for the technology to sort of mature, but I think we're, we're finally there. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Entrepreneurship 101. Um, as always, we want to thank CIBC for their generous support. And I want to thank you for braving winter's last blast to, to come out here. Um, it's not that nice out here. I had a colleague this morning who spent an hour and a half um, trying to get into work and then just turned around and went back home because she hadn't even hit steels coming down from the north. So uh, again, thank you for uh, braving it to, to get in here. Um, before we start, I have a slide. Beyond compliance to innovation, the business case for accessibility. This is one of the MARS best practices uh, series. And, um, you know, on a personal note, you all watch me kind of struggle up the stairs here. Um, a year ago, I won't lie, I, it, I wouldn't say that I would have leapt up them, but I at least walked up normally. And then my left knee blew out uh, through arthritis. And then later on, just earlier this year, my right knee is going well. I had no idea about how hard it is if you have if you can't really do stairs in this world and we I don't see our colleagues here tonight we normally have a couple of folks here in wheelchairs and I am just beginning to get a taste of what accessibility challenges are and you know my case is minor but I think all of us, and it's an object lesson, um, yes, there are laws about accessibility. There are business opportunities. We are in a world where accessibility is not only mandatory, it's ethically uh, our responsibility, and there's business opportunities there. And so um, that's what this is, is all about. As usual with best practices, we'll have a series of real uh, top-notch speakers speakers talking about this um, and uh, it's you know it's not an obstacle it's uh, it's really an opportunity so enough said about uh, promoting that and that is um, yes it's April uh, April Fool's Day um, noon until 1 30 here in Mars uh, okay the studio um, it's on this level down towards the food court, it's between, um, sorry, Subway and Teriyaki, all right? <laughs> uh, it, I don't know how well signed, how, Claude, I don't know if there's a sign up there, but between Subway and Teriyaki, and you'll, you'll find it, okay? Good spot. Um, so, tonight, um, our lecture is on go-to-market strategy. Um, and uh, we have a speaker I'm delighted to welcome, a colleague of mine from Mars, John Dogtrom. John is a senior advisor in our clean tech practice. Um, he comes with a degree in civil and environmental energy, followed up with work at MIT Sloan School of Management on product management and marketing. Uh, in uh, business, he in uh, 97, he co-founded Sustainable Energy Technologies, which uh, still operates as one of Canada's leading power electronics companies for solar power. 
Uh, he did a stint with the Pembina Institute, and many of you will recognize that name as, as a blue chip um, uh, consulting organization in the area of low impact renewable energy and energy policy. He moved from there to hydrogenics. You just saw hydrogenics. Um, uh, and he really focused there on strategic partnerships, product development, and sales and marketing. So we, have, we consider ourselves really fortunate to have snagged him to come in uh, to Mars as an advisor uh, in our clean tech practice. Um, and uh, so, John, I'll uh, ask you to come up and tell us how to go to market. Thanks very much. Uh, great to see so many people here. I wasn't sure with the weather. Um, so I was asked to come to talk to you for 40 minutes on uh, go-to-market strategy. And as Tony mentioned, I work within our advisory services group, specifically the clean tech area. And when I'm working there, I'm, I'm dealing with entrepreneurs one-on-one. -on -one. And that's a lot easier than what we're gonna to try to accomplish in the next 40 minutes. Um, all of you are working in different fields from IT, life science, clean tech. All of you have very different products and very different customers. So it's difficult for me to talk about something like a go-to-market strategy that will specifically apply to all of you. Um, what I've tried to do is uh, put together some overall strategy slides and uh, what I really want to talk to you about is just some of my own experiences. And what I'm hoping is that through a combination of the two, you guys, uh, the challenge for you is to find something relevant to your particular situation. So we're both a little bit challenged over the next 40 minutes. Um, the other thing that I want to focus on, because one thing that's common to all of us, is uh, in rolling out our products, we all have customers, no matter how different they may be, whether it's original equipment manufacturers or end users. Um, what we need to do when we think about our go-to-market strategy is put ourselves in the customer's shoes. And I'm gonna talk a lot about the buying process that a customer goes through and relate that to specific actions that you have to be taking as the customer is going through their process. Um, some of the uh, specifics that we'll get into are educating your customer, proving yourself to your customer, differentiating your solution, and scaling it so that you get many, many customers. So our overall goal is we'll focus on those key activities and uh, we'll talk about some of the, the first customers and like I said, with a customer-oriented perspective. Now when it comes to uh, strategy planning, no matter what the strategy is for, um, whether it's sales or product development, um, everyone has to get on the same page with it in the, in the organization. And at the end of the day, a strategy needs to answer three questions. How are we creating value? How are we delivering value? And how are we capturing value? And with the go-to-market strategy, you really have to think about these three questions from the perspective of your customer. Um, Tony provided a bit of an introduction on my background. Just to, to put things into context, I um, have focused always on the energy industry, specifically high-tech products within that industry. Power electronics in the first case and in the latter case, it was fuel cells and hydrogen generation equipment. And all of the strategies that I focused on in getting out to the market was in partnership with OEMs, with original equipment manufacturers. Um, now, like I said, there will be similarities. An OEM is a customer just like an end user is a customer. And customers think the same way no matter how large their organization may be. Um, so just, I, I wanted to put that in context for you because a lot of what you'll see and hear me talking about is really delivering a, a, a high-tech product 
to an OEM, an original equipment manufacturer. So as far as a, a definition of, of a go-to-market plan or a go-to-market strategy, it's a, a pretty all-encompassing term. And what I want to stress is that the planning for your, for your go-to-market strategy really goes across all levels of your organization, no matter how large or small your organization may be. There's going to be marketing involved up front sales and marketing throughout the entire process, but also product development, and even the research and development that you're doing with your particular product to improve it for your customers, they have to be on the same page with the plan as well. And your service. Of course, the sale's not over when, when you sell it, and in many ways the process is just beginning. So it really goes across all aspects of the organization. And the number one objective with the go-to-market plan is that you're feeding your sales pipeline. You're generating as many leads as possible, you're converting those leads into opportunities, and at the end of the day, winning some orders. The activities involved are everything from building awareness and uh, lead generation to often field trials, uh, which, is, which is a way that, that I have worked in the past with different customers. And your plan really needs to address a really wide range of questions. Where are you in the value chain of the industry that you're in? Um, where does your solution end and maybe a partner's solution pick that up? Is your sales team structured by region? Is your product team structured by application? There's a whole bunch of questions that need to be answered and you need to brainstorm those questions and, and, and get them all identified up front as you make your plan. So when we make the plan, we have to start out with our value proposition. And the value proposition is really the launching point of your go-to-market strategy. What I have here is um, a graph that shows along this axis dollars per unit. So it's either price or cost of an individual product. And along this axis is volume and it's also a function of time. The line that you see here is pretty typical for getting any product out there. As you increase in volume and as time goes on, your prices come down. Two of the businesses that I've uh, focused on in the past, um, inverters and fuel cells, they've always had a lot of different markets and a lot of different opportunities that we had to look at. And that was part of the challenge and part of the first step in putting together our plan, was who do we target when and how do we target them? What you see here, these different uh, bubbles that I have, these represent the relative market size for different segments and for different applications. And the colors that you see show the strength of the value proposition in each one. With green being ones that are pretty straightforward as far as the value that you're offering to the customer, the yellow or the red ones being a little more difficult. And you can see where they fall with volume and price. There's some relatively easy ones to hit, and then there's some more difficult ones. And of course, there's usually a, a giant one at the end that you really want to get to. Um, what you need to do is plot this out, figure out those markets and those applications, and then how you're going to go after each one, the order in which you're going to do it. And in my mind, what's always been really important right from the beginning is to understand where your technology is going and how it's going to evolve. When I say where it's going, I mean how is the functionality going to improve over time? And what are you going to be able to do to turn some of these yellow value propositions into green ones? And are there things that you can do on the product development side that actually increase the relative size of the market? 
Ideally, what happens over time is as you start to go through this process and you start to engage with customers, you'll end up getting pulled in one direction, which is a great thing to have happen, and that's what you are striving for. Within each of those segments and uh, markets, you all have probably seen something like this or this exact graph before. And uh, this is showing market dynamics, and it's pretty typical of any market. This is the uh, number of units that you see up here, and this is time. And these are the characteristics of different consumers and their relative size. So when you start out down here, you are starting out with not a lot of volume out there in the market early on in time. And you're really selling to innovators and early adopters. And as you go into all of these different segments, your customers are really quite different. You know, they have different affinity for risk, different level of knowledge, and different level of interest in your product. And these lines that you see here, these transition points, are the points at which your organization really needs to transform and change a little bit. If you're in the manufacturing of things, you can imagine how much it changes as your volume increases. You have to change your manufacturing processes uh, in order to help lower your cost and just keep up with demand. Um, what I've always found is that innovators and early adopters are relatively easy to find, but there's only a handful of them. But if you have really neat technology that does something new, you'll always find half a dozen to a dozen people that want to try it out and do something with it. The challenge in your go-to-market strategy is trying to figure out how you're going to get to this early majority, the larger volume, the higher number of customers. And in all of the businesses that I've been involved in, we've worked with innovators and early adopters at the beginning, right? And fed some of the learnings from that process back into our product development so that we get ready for this early majority and we tweak our product and improve it so that this becomes possible and becomes a reality. In the go-to-market strategy, um, focusing on this group is really what you want to be doing. And just to put the timeline into, into perspective, um, innovators and early adopters, they, they will come to you, they will seek you out, they'll find you. But you're going to spend a lot of time building up your strategy to get to this point. So I mentioned that we'd talk a little bit about uh, the customer buying process. And I think this relates to a wide range of customer types, uh, whether it's a company or an individual. And we've all seen this too when we go through our own purchases. There's a problem that the customer is looking to solve. They go out, search for ways of solving that problem, evaluate the alternatives based on price, based on functionality. They get into a purchase decision, and then after that purchase, they think about whether or not they would do the same thing again. And what I wanted to point out was, throughout the customer buying process, there are different areas that your company or your organization needs to focus on. So right up front, when the customer is looking to solve their problem, they've recognized their problem, what you need to get them to do is recognize your solution. And I'll get into some of the potential ways of getting out there and, and letting people know about your solution and what you can do. Then when they're into their information search and evaluating their alternatives, that's when you are proving your company and your product and your capabilities to them so that when they get to that purchase decision, you're the one at the negotiating table working through the terms of it with them. And like I said, after the sale's done, you're still building that relationship and you're taking a lot of the knowledge and putting it back into your product team so that you can improve it and reach more customers.
So now I just want to um, touch on some of those individual areas. And the first one is the education por portion and educating the customer on your solution. One of the things that uh, it can be tough at times, especially if you're selling a solution to an original equipment manufacturer or to another company, is trying to figure out who specifically within that organization is your starting point to make the sale. Um, and to give you an example, and I'm going to draw on this example a couple times, and you, you heard a bit about it in the uh, video before I got up here. Um, but I've, I've spent some time selling backup power systems into the telecommunications market. So essentially what I'm talking about there is that all these individual cell phone towers, every time the grid goes down, that carrier is losing revenue. They're dropping calls and they're not generating the revenue because they're not up and running and they can't support your call anymore. Um, those carriers are large organizations and it's the network managers, uh, the people that were in charge of infrastructure at all of those individual sites and had the mandate of keeping things up and running that we needed to target when we were trying to deliver backup power systems. They knew of a bunch of solutions that were already out there. There were different types of battery chemistries, diesel generators, of course, sort of more traditional forms of backup power that they would typically use when the grid would go down, these systems would come on and keep things up and running. What we had to do was introduce them to a new concept and a new way of providing backup power at their sites. And the thing that we did right at the beginning was we, we did white papers and we went out to conferences that were specifically targeted to network managers. They would all get together once a year in different parts of the world and talk about their infrastructure and share ideas on how they could improve it. And putting together a white paper and speaking at those conferences was the single best way that I could target an audience from a large number of potential customers or telecom carriers. And uh, that to me was a really valuable tool. And the other thing that helped was getting some articles and some magazines, really just letting people know that there were alternative solutions out there. And we spent quite a bit of time doing that. The other thing that we had to do was we had to find channels and we had to find partners to get into these organizations. These organizations were uh, a lot larger than us. And they didn't necessarily want to deal with uh, the little guys from, uh, from some place called Mississauga. They wanted to deal with some of the traditional large companies that they had worked with before. So at the same time that we were targeting those customers and those network managers, we were also reaching out to the OEMs and the people that provided their diesel generators and their battery systems. Once, you, once people know that your solution is out there, they've heard about it, they've read some interesting articles on it, well now you have to prove to them that your solution is superior to the others and that you're the company that can deliver it. So they know they have a problem, they're out there searching for solutions, they've heard of yours, but now they want to evaluate it. And they want to evaluate it and compare it to the alternatives. This is where, um, to me, really the, the, the easiest way when you're dealing with a technology product to prove something to the customer was to demonstrate it. And typically they wouldn't accept a demonstration that was in an, in an environment outside of their regular area of operation. Um, you know, we would show up with uh, power up a system, show them how it runs and show them how it operates. And that's one thing to do inside their office. Um, and it's a totally different thing to drop off a unit in uh, the middle of nowhere, really at a remote site, walk away and just have it work all on its own. So what we had to do was go into trials with these customers. And uh, it, this was, um, it, it wasn't an easy task. 
in that we were looking to do trials with people and people will always accept a trial from you, especially when there's no cost. They're delighted to try out your equipment, no problem. They'll put it on a site. What we had to be careful of is there's obviously a financial risk in deploying these units with these customers. So we had to use these trials as a negotiating tool and tell them, you know, we'll go into this trial with you, but this trial is going to prove some very specific functionality that we're going to talk about ahead of time. And if we meet all of the targets and we show you that we're reliable, we're available, we have the durability, the fuel logistics are there, then I wanted to know that it was going to lead to an order of 10 or 20 or 100 and that we were going to be able to work together beyond just the trial. A trial takes, it took a lot of resources and it took a lot of time. Because every time we deployed something out in the field, we basically had to have someone out nearby ready to respond if anything went wrong. We had to limit our risk in doing it because having the grid go down and having our system not come on was a sure way to not be invited back into the office and would never get us to the negotiating round. I, w I wanted to show you an example of what I'm talking about. And uh, the reason why we would get into these trials was to give them data and to turn what we were selling from fiction into fact. We could sit around the boardroom table and they could listen to my claims on reliability and durability, but they wanted to see it tested. What you see here, um, this is a failure duration in hours. From, uh, it's in one hour increments. And uh, this is days along the bottom here. This is a 50-day uh, trial at a telecom site in uh, India, just outside of Delhi. And it's actually pretty interesting information that you see here. And uh, in, in some ways, it's, uh, it's hard to believe when you look at the frequency of outages. Over a 50-day period, there were 235 power outages, and we ran for 156 hours. And every time this unit came on, myself, the network manager at the, of, of, for, the, uh, for the carrier or for the customer we were working with, we'd get an email that would tell us that the grid is down, the system's on, we'd know what power level it ran at, and we'd know when it shut off. What we were providing them with on the data side was something they had never seen before. They had no idea the extent of the problem that they were dealing with. They had a rough idea on how much diesel was being delivered to site, but they weren't entirely sure. The records weren't that accurate. We now had a very precise way of putting their problem into dollars and cents for them. They knew what an hour of downtime meant as far as lost revenue was concerned, and now they knew exactly how frequently they were losing revenue and in what kind of quantities. Um, the other thing that was interesting is we were providing them with a level of data that was actually uh, superior to what they could get from the local power company. The telecom company was now armed with more information on grid quality within that sector of India than the, uh, than the electrical provider. And in doing this, what this did is this data really empowered our customer. It, it gave the network manager and the infrastructure person within the company the ability to take, you know, fact and numbers and go to their management and say, here's why we need to do this. And here's the extent of the problem that we've been talking about. And for them to be able to have that internally was really powerful. I'm always careful about, um, people talk a lot about, uh, you know, starting out in your marketing process, in educating the customer on their problem. To me, that's, that's a difficult position to be in. It's going to be very hard to sell me something if you first have to explain to me that I need it. But if I know that I need something and you come to me and show me with data just how badly I need it, that's a different scenario.
So now that the customer, if I just go back for a second. We've talked about the problem. We've talked about the information search and evaluating alternatives. And we've looked at one example of how you can prove your, your technology and your product. Now we're getting into the purchasing decision phase. And in the purchasing decision phase, this is where your relationship within the organization becomes really important. Um, what I've always found is that you need a champion. If you're selling to an OEM, you need a champion or a coach within that organization. The champion and the coach for us became the person that we were arming with the data. All of a sudden, their job was a lot easier. In, ju in justifying the allocation of funds to solve the problem. They now had data, they had figures and numbers that showed why they needed it, and they became the champion for us. The other thing that's important in having a champion is they can help sort of fill you in on how the organization works, what some of the competing technologies are, and other people that are in the running to solve the same problem that you're trying to solve. What we always found is that the biggest competition, and you've probably heard this before from other people, was the do nothing, right? If the network manager did what they did yesterday and they didn't get in trouble, then they're gonna just do the same thing tomorrow. And that was probably the biggest obstacle to go against. But by arming them with data and having them on our side at that point, kind of helped them to be able to show why it made sense to do something. When it comes to them making a decision, often there will now be a request for proposal. An RFP will come out that you need to respond to. And uh, you all know this. You have to understand the exact scope of it, who it's going to, what the decision process is. And you need to include a wide range of information in your proposal. And the proposal to me is really just uh, a pitch in a slightly different format. And uh, I think you have a session coming up on, on the pitch, which, which may be tailored a little more to investors, but it relates to customers as well. And a lot of the same things that you're gonna hear about in that session relate to the proposal stage in your go-to-market strategy. You have to uh, provide the context of what you're doing. And what I mean by providing the context, really what I'm talking about here is letting them know that you understand their problem. And hopefully, like the example that I've shown you, you actually understand their problem to a greater extent than they did before. And that's really important. The other thing that's important is to clearly articulate your solution. Of course, you're gonna have to get into pricing details and often that will depend on volume as well. If you can supply a sample contract with your terms and conditions up front, that's great. I think it's great to have all that information up at the front before you get into the negotiation stage. And uh, supporting documentation. You're going to need to show them that the people involved in, in your company or yourself, that you're capable of delivering what you've said you're gonna deliver. So supporting documentation is going to include bios. It's going to include information on what you've done in the past and how it's been successful. The other thing that's important to realize is that at the proposal stage, there's going to be people reading your proposal that you've never met before. And they're going to be from a lot of different backgrounds. There needs to be technical information and business information included. And the other thing to be aware of, and uh, I know that you'll get into this with the pitch, is you typically may only have a few minutes right at the beginning of your proposal to capture their attention. And a lot of the people who review it are only going to read the executive summary. So you have to be very clear, concise, and articulate in what you're trying to do right up front. The other thing that I want to talk about is differentiation and differentiating your solution and your proposal from all of the other ones that they're looking at. Like I said, you have to show them that you understand their problems. 
The other thing that's important is references. If you can differentiate yourself by providing good references, okay, it may be um, an analyst briefing from a third party that talks about your solution and maybe the particulars of your company and what you've done. If you can provide that up front, that helps a lot. The other thing that's really valuable is customer testimonials and reference projects. Once you've got your first customer and your first project done, then you have the ability to use that information with other customers. And in some cases, it may just be the data from the trial that you've done. But you're going to need some form of reference so that they can see that you're capable of doing what you say you're going to do. The other thing that I wanted to mention in a tool that I, probably the most valuable thing that I've found in any go-to-market strategy, especially in high tech dealing with large companies. I talked about uh, doing a white paper in order to get your solution recognized and out there. The other thing that's really valuable is incorporating your customer into the white paper or doing the white paper with the OEM, the original equipment manufacturer that you're trying to sell to. So what we would do is we would go into a field trial and we would say part of the deal in doing this field trial is we're going to work on a white paper together that's going to go through the advantages of the technology and that's also going to look at the cost, the capital costs, the operational costs and what the savings involved were. Technical people within an organization love to write white papers and they love to get the opportunity to speak at a conference. And for me, the most valuable thing that could happen was there would be a room of network power managers for different telecom carriers, and we would have one telecom carrier up there basically selling our product to the rest of them. And that was by far the most valuable tool that, that I could find in getting results. The other thing that I wanted to mention was partnerships. And that's a really great way to differentiate yourself as well. To be able to, uh, to, to have a, a well-respected partner that may be someone that they've worked with before in the past on your side and delivering the product with you, that really helps to differentiate you. Then when they're looking at two different solutions, maybe even of the same type, both from small organizations, do they go with with the one that's, that's going at it on their own, or do they go with the one that's partnered up with someone who they know is already a really great supplier to them? So that was the other um, key differentiator that I've found helpful. So at that point, now the customer is into the uh, purchase decision. And uh, you've heard it before, and it's cliche, but people buy from people. And this is why your relationship and your coach within that organization um, is so important. When you get into the negotiation stage, there's uh, really, um, really the most important thing that you need to do is be prepared for it. And you need to be prepared for it on two fronts. You need to understand what you're going to be able to give up and what's important to you when you go into it. And you also have to really have a deep understanding of what's important to them and what they're going to be able to let slide and what they're not going to be able to let slide. And you would always leave room within your proposal for a little bit of negotiation. You would know that they're going to work you down from the price that you went in with or some characteristics of your solution. So. You have to be prepared for that up front. And nothing helps a negotiation better than you going into it knowing that you're priced 20% higher than you need to be and you're already sitting at the table. It makes life a lot easier. So after the negotiation's done, you've successfully uh, uh, landed that order. You've now established some trust and a track record with that customer. And word of mouth, no matter what industry you're in, is such a powerful sales tool. 
And that's the, uh, it's, it's, it's so valuable in that now your sales team has expanded greatly because you've got someone else talking about your solution with the right people in the right industry and they're speaking the same language. The other thing is once you've done one with, with a customer, you're armed with so much more information on how that customer and how other customers within the same space are going to look at your solution and how they're going to rate it compared to others and what's important to them. And uh, that's really valuable information that your sales team can use, but also that your product development team can use and that you can feed back over to them, you know, and make some subtle changes in the product in order to help please the next customer even more. And uh, one of my colleagues used to always talk about the, uh, the say-do ratio and how important it was to maintain. We would tell them we were going to do this. We'd say it and then we'd do it. And we'd point out afterwards, we said we were going to do this, we did that. And then the next time we said we were going to do something, we had to make sure we were actually going to be able to do it. We never, uh, you never want to overstretch. You always want to uh, under-promise and over-deliver, of course. So just in, in summary, um, I wanted to mention a few things. Most important thing that, that I've found is to focus on your go-to-market strategy from the customer's perspective. Again, what is the value you're creating for them? How are you delivering it to them? The other thing that I've mentioned a couple times is involve all aspects of the organization, from product development to service, sales and marketing. Everyone needs to be on the same page and everyone needs to have the same customer focus. Another thing I've talked about a lot is fully understanding the customer's problem. And if possible, if you can help to quantify the size of that problem for them and provide them with additional information, all the power to you. The other thing is know where your technology is going. And what I mean by that is make sure you understand that, especially in high tech, things evolve very quickly. And in some of the industries that I've been in, in the fuel cell industry, for example, I had to know where we were going to be from a reliability and a durability point of view ahead of time because I was involved in sales cycles and courting customers that I knew were going to take six months in order to deliver a purchase order. So I had to uh, walk the line as far as figuring out what I could promise and what I could still deliver on. So it's really important that the whole team's working together so that you understand what the product development team's going to be able to deliver and they understand what your salesperson is going to be out there selling. The other thing we talked about is using data to prove your capabilities. Um, picture is worth a thousand words and data is worth a thousand pictures. And differentiating your solution and your approach and whether it's through white papers or partnering with another organization that already has channels and uh, a means of getting into that market on the distribution side, any way that you can partner up to differentiate, that's a great, great thing to do. And as I mentioned, building a relationship with an internal champion within the organization. And a lot of these other things, like providing them with that level of data, really helps to get those relationships established. So thanks very much. I hope that um, there's something within what I've shared with you that you can uh, think about and relate to the specific circumstances that you're dealing with and with the types of customers that you're dealing with. Thanks a lot.